There in verse 16, it's written by Paul, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and, I will, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm fairly certain that each and every one of us has a group of close friends that we would call members of our inner circle. They might know our secrets. Going to the younger bunch, they probably know your crush, whatever that really means. They might know your deepest thoughts, and the list can go on from there. But when push comes to shove, as things often do, our members of your inner circle, people that you can rely on for help, when you fall on tough times, when maybe there's a death in your family, or if there's good things, maybe you get a uh, promotion at work, or you know, you have a marriage. What kind of people are in your inner circle? Are they there for you? So hearkening back to our phrase, just because they're in your circle does not mean that they're in your corner. Are they there when you need them? When we, when we turn over to 2 Corinthians 11, verses 16 through 33, we're not going to read that, but in that passage, the Apostle Paul outlines the various sufferings that he endured simply because he was a Christian. All those different beatings... All those different forms of persecution. And he did it because he was a faithful member of the church. By being faithful to Christ, he endured these different persecutions. Yet through it all, he remained faithful, knowing that Christ would in fact deliver him. As we read moments ago, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. You see, even though those of his circle abandoned him, there was still one in his corner, and that was Jesus our Lord. Then we consider Jesus our, our Lord himself. We sang the song moments ago, I, I think it was actually this morning, in preparation for the Lord's Supper. Of how Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, there to pray. Who did he take with him? Peter, James, and John. And he expected them to, to stay up with him. He was about to pray for the coming moments in his life. He knew what was coming. He was soon to be crucified. When you think about all the different things that he was to endure, most people can't handle that in a day's a normal day's work. But keep in mind, he was sleep deprived as well. So the different beatings, the mockings, and the crucifixion itself, he endured that. Was it any great thing for his request for these three men, his personal friends, to stay awake long enough to be there to comfort him while he prayed three times in this garden? We know of this account in Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 46. Every time he came back from his prayer, what did he find? He found those in his circle asleep. Now, no doubt, they were tired. Obviously, they were. They fell asleep. But they weren't in his corner. To add insult to injury, moments beyond that, Judas the betrayer came to bring him to the officials of the day. Matthew 26, verses 47 through 55. One of the twelve disciples or apostles that he had handpicked was there stabbing him in the back. Again, a member of his circle, but not one who was in his corner. As a result of this betrayal, when Jesus was taken into custody, as it were, what happened to the disciples? 
Well, verse 56 of Matthew 26 says the disciples fled. They fled from Jesus. Again, people who would be close to him. Again, were not in his corner. Now, he gave this, this solemn warning to his apostles in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 20. He pointed out to them that the world will hate them. Well, why is that? Because the world hated Jesus. And the servant is not above his master. And as a result, the world will hate the apostles. And the world will hate us by extension for being faithful to Christ and his gospel. In fact, we're promised again in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, that we will suffer persecution if we will live godly. There, now, there's no doubt that each of us have endured similar things, certainly no, no anything close to what Jesus endured. But maybe we've experienced things similar to what Paul went through. Again, by comparison, especially in this country, we have it very easy. When you think of other countries, and I've, I've used this example before, that as a punishment for holding a Bible in certain Middle Eastern countries, they would take razor blades to that hand and cut it. It looked like somebody had diced a potato. That's how finely cut this hand was. Are we prepared to deal with that in America? I don't think we are. We've gotten soft. Now, I think... Oftentimes we would mentally affirm that we're ready. But when push comes to shove, are we there? Or are we more like his apostles when Judas led Jesus away with the leaders of that day? Are we going to flee? Run into hiding? As Christians, we are to be in Christ's inner circle. Now on this, on this planet, we are also to have his corner. After all, we are to be about our Father's business teaching the gospel to others. That's not always an easy thing to do, but it still must be done. Being faithful to God will always bring some amount of suffering in the flesh. Are we prepared for that? Well, the point of this is, when you consider the world at large, who do they have in their corner? It's not God. It's not our Lord. In fact, it's Satan. Satan. Satan is in their corner. And often, every single time, what does he do to them? He betrays them. Here's some sin. I know it's enticing. You're going to enjoy it. After all, sin is enjoyable. And they go right ahead and commit that sin. Don't you think Satan understands and knows that whoever sins will be eternally lost once that is, or if that sin goes unrepented of? After all, hell, Gehenna, is prepared for the devil and his angels. Don't you think he realizes that? Just like a wounded animal, they're going to fight and fight and not really give any attention or care for their own life. They fight harder, knowing that they will die. However, this does not have to remain such. We don't have to keep Satan in our corner. But the only way this can change, the only way it will change, is through obedience to the gospel of Christ. Being obedient to that gospel of Christ, ultimately resulting in an alien sinner being baptized for the remission of sins, rising from that water as a child of God, a Christian, they at that point, and until the day they die, if they're remaining faithful, guess who's in their corner? Romans chapter 8 Verses 31 through 34. I know this is a favorite passage of many here. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? 
It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Even though we have committed sins, and Satan has the right to say, oh yeah, he's your child, but did you consider the things he's done? But God justifieth. Our risen Savior can stand there, yes, those things are true, but my blood covers those sins. My child has repented of those sins. They're not to be held against him anymore. If you're an alien sinner, you do not have that benefit. Unfortunately, most of the world is in this category. Why not take the few moments ahead of us to obey the gospel of Christ, to become a Christian, to put those sins behind you, to have them remitted, to be bought back. If you're a Christian and you have allowed sin into your life, why not have those sins remitted again through repentance and prayer? If either of these is a need that you have, please make it known as together we stand and sing.